If you need more than ten rounds to hunt, and some argue they hunt with that many rounds, you shouldn't be hunting. If you can't get the deer in three shots, you shouldn't be hunting. You are an embarrassment. I was going to foot him, uh, foot, foot, excuse me. Hello again, and welcome back to the series. I'm your host, and today we're... <laughs> Oh, holy crap. And today we're looking at 1942's visual masterwork, Bambi. This script was written by Alexei. I do, however, have a head. It's attached to my body, it is me. Ah, uh, so thank you, Alexei. It'll still be me. If you're new here, welcome for the first time of I Hope Many. And if you're returning, I thank you once again for your continued patronage. Now sit back, relax, and let's get into this together. Bambi was based on the 1923 novel Bambi, A Life in the Woods, by Austrian author and hunter Felix Salton. That's right, dude. The freaking villain of the movie, a hunter, man, wrote the original novel. Come on, man. History truly is written by the victors. Insert meme. End of quote. Repeat the line. This is the fifth and final film of the Golden Era, as it is commonly referred to, or Tar and Sugar Era, as those who lived through it actually more often referred to it. And I ate Jenny's ice cream, chocolate chip. Anyway, this is the fifth and final film before the six package films begin, and this film, in sharp contrast to many moments in Dumbo, is probably the most visually accomplished and stunningly animated film of Disney Animation's first era. Disney bought the film rights to the novel from MGM in 1937, upon the success of Snow White, as head honchos at MGM had decided that it would be impractical to film a live-action version of the entirely deer-focused source material. Walt had originally intended this to be their second feature following Snow White, until it became clear that the adaptation of the fairly grim and for adults source novel into something more child-friendly would take more time than anticipated, as well as the artists at Disney finding it far more difficult to animate realistically moving deer than they had initially expected. These and other issues caused the full-on production of Bambi to be delayed, until Pinocchio and Fantasia had both been almost completed, the work on Bambi finally beginning in earnest on August 17, 1939. Writer and animator Mel Shaw said of the writing process that, The story of Bambi had so many possibilities. You could go off on a million tangents. I remember one situation when Walt became involved with himself. He said, Suppose we have Bambi step on an ant hill and we cut inside and we see all the damage he's done to the ant civilization. We spent weeks and weeks developing the ants and then all of a sudden we decided, you know, we're way off the story. This has got nothing to do with the story of Bambi. We also had a family of grasshoppers and they get into a family squabble of this or that and, and Bambi is watching all of this and here's the big head of Bambi and the grasshoppers. And what's that got to do with the story and this would go on many times. Clearly, Walt and his brain trust were having some difficulty pinning down just exactly what should and should not be in this meditative and nature focused film. Bambi cost just over $850,000 to make, and while it wasn't quite as big of a smash hit as Disney was hoping for, this film eventually did even better than Dumbo had the year prior, earning back eventually $2.9 million worldwide in its initial theatrical run. While still not anywhere near reaching the financial world domination of Snow White, Bambi was definitely a solid success, even despite earning fairly mixed critical reception at the time. As for my own writing process, I basically picked this one to do out of a hat. I didn't watch Bambi very many times growing up, and I don't have very much of a personal connection to it, so let's see what I thought. 
I wrote this bit here at the very end of the review, and I had a heck of a lot more to say about this movie than I thought I was going to. <laughs> okay, now before we get into the sections, I'm going to uh, wave my magic Pepsi can. And uh, when I've completed the spell, I'll have changed my clothes, I'll have brought a deer stuffed animal onto the desk because I meant to do that, and I'll have a full Pepsi can. Because this one has been opened and drunk. So once I wave the magic Pepsi can, It'll all be changed in three, two, one. Did it work? Yes, it did. All full. <laughs> the dear deer is here. I have been changed from my uh, <clears throat> my things into something warmer. Clearly, the magic Pepsi can could tell that I was a little bit cold. This magic Pepsi can was given to me by my Fairy God Corporation, so, you know, <laughs> it's pretty powerful. Let's see if it can uh, get me another snack for myself to munch on. Aha! Uh -huh. uh, it's cheese and, uh... Cheese and Sour Patch Kids. Now if I need a backup drink... Ah! <laughs> you get me. All right, now let's crack on. Thank you, Fairy God Corporation. Thank you. Wow. 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 Well, there's absolutely no two ways about it, but gosh darn, this is a very pretty movie. Every still is like a painting. Definitely top five most gorgeous Disney animated classic ever. The slow movements of the animals are so fluid and smooth that at points they look and feel more real than any of the soulless, hollow CGI puppets from The Lion King 2019. Simba! The pop of the colors and the crispness of the line work is at an all-time high here for their cell animation process. We're in our and their grasp on the animation of animal movement has improved by leaps and bounds since the already impressive Snow White in 1937. The character designs in this movie are beyond brilliant. Every one of them feels and moves like a real animal, but their slightly exaggerated cartoon faces give the perfect amount of emotional weight to the naturalistic animal movements. One of the nine old men, Eric Larson, our friend who animated Figaro, said that though they had previously had to animate deers for a few moments in Snow White, the deer had looked and moved like big flower sacks. Moments like the animation of the changing seasons are just totally breathtaking. So many scenes and sequences stand out casually in this movie that it's almost impossible to pick. From the introduction of the Great Prince of the Forest, to Bambi's fight with Rano, which is honestly stronger visually than Simba's similar showdown with Scar, to the burning of the forest and the breathless escape from man and the flames he caused. This film is a visual marvel on a level Disney has rarely reached since, especially in its particular depiction of the natural world and of the often silent animals themselves. So much of this movie is bereft of any dialogue, and it works incredibly well when there is this much to look at and this much wonderful score beneath it. But my penalty! I've got to have a penalty! Speaking of that, the score is totally gorgeous. So many parts stand out, and it's all uniformly beautiful and orchestral, so I'll only mention the intro of the prince, the fight with Rano, the death of Bambi's mother, the escape in the final few minutes. Basically take any major action beat in the film, and there will be thrilling score present to underline it. The music was nominated for Best Original Score at the Oscars, once again like a couple of our previous films in the series, but unlike them, it failed to actually win. DISAPPOINTED! The actual songs as well are all quite good, though I won't really mention any by name, as none of them stand out individually. They do definitely, however, date the film. Maybe more than any other set of songs within the Golden Era. While nice to listen to, these songs absolutely scream the 1940s. I left this section to write last. 
as I wanted to have a much firmer grasp on what Bambi is as a complete piece of art before I analyze the titular character as a protagonist. Bambi is a character defined by the concepts of growth and love, duty to others, and the protection of what you hold dear. Pun very much intended. He is defined by his relationships to others, and how they help him on his journey of self-discovery. A little more than the first half of the film is devoted almost exclusively to the young Bambi's relationship to his mother. Even when the two of them aren't the focus of the scene, she is always there in the background, watching on as he has fun with Flower, Thumper, and Feline. She loves, protects, and nurtures him, and when she is gone, his father does the same. Bambi's bond with his father is much more shown than told, their silent looks back and forth together saying more than dozens of minutes of dialogue between other pairs of characters. Bambi's relationships with friend Owl, Thumper, and Flower are all a massive part of his development, and finally Feline is the perfect other half to our young stag prince, a gorgeous, sleek, and quietly powerful feminine presence by his side. Bambi's relationships are his central driving force, and the key to his character. Bambi is driven by the grief and trauma of his mother's death to never let the same fate befall anyone in his life ever again, if he can help it. His rescue of Feline from man's many hunting dogs is the perfect showcase of his incredible bravery and selflessness as a protagonist, and an effective culmination of his character arc. With this act, he finally earns his place as the successor to his father's mantle of respect and majesty, and faces and defeats his greatest fears in the process, all while saving the enchanting young doe that he loves. Four different voice actors combined to vocally bring Bambi to life, similar to the three used for Wart in The Sword in the Stone. Overall, Bambi is a fantastic lead, serving the film both as a wonderful character to pin our emotions on, as well as maybe the single most adorable looking young protagonist in the long history of cute Disney animals, other than Dumbo. Seriously, he is so freaking cute. I really love old friend Owl and the voice performance behind him from the incredibly well-employed character actor of the era, Will Wright. I like how he's all busy tittering about a prince being born. Bambi, truly the first Disney prince. Although the first little prince or princess film for boys movie was Pinocchio, as we discussed earlier in that video. This also makes it feel extremely similar to the opening few minutes of The Lion King. Side note, but several Disney movies start with specifically the birth of an important royal character, usually the protagonist. Other examples include, as mentioned, The Lion King, as well as Sleeping Beauty, Hercules, and Tangled. Thumper is a more than usually famous side character as Disney goes, and I like him. He and Bambi are an iconic pair of friends, and I feel like I'm going to be using the already overused word iconic a lot in this deer. But that's what this film is. Firmly part of Disney's identity, overall story as a company, and their iconography. With all that said, Thumper is, along with Jiminy Cricket and the Seven Dwarves, one of Disney's original sidekicks, and he and Bambi are one of their most essential pairs of friends. He's a real one for always being there for Bambi and for teaching Bambi how to walk on the frozen lake. His voice is adorable, and his movements are so slow and floofy, you just really want to squoosh him right up in a little ball. Paula Winslow is enchanting as the voice of Bambi's mother. As perhaps the most famous death in all of Disney, if not all of children's or animated film history, Bambi's mom is a character that we must totally be in love with before she is killed. For her death to scar billions of children, she had to be our mom that that hunter was shooting too, and she is perfectly maternal. When she is shot, it's as if you cut down Molly Weasley in her prime. More seriously, she imbues the character with a youthful yet knowing and wise maternal spirit that is honestly spectacular. The most famous Disney parent character before Mufasa. Her scene where she first shows Bambi the meadow is sweet and perfectly cautionary. She's also a real one for being Bambi's first ever wingman when he meets Feline the little fawn. Bambi's relationship with his mom is the backbone and foundation of this movie, and the only reason her death is so heartbreakingly effective is because the bond between Bambi and his mom is the entire first 42 minutes of the film. It's maybe the saddest moment in Disney history, and I felt it in this watch. F's in the chat for Bambi's mom.
Au moment où le cerf m'a attaqué, je ne... Bond had also initially actually wanted to show the death of Bambi's mother on screen before the animators convinced him that this would be just a bit too brutal and traumatic for children. They opted to go with an off-screen gunshot as Bambi is running away, basically. Clearly, the animation department was learning from some of the perhaps more ill-advisedly insane moments of trauma from Pinocchio. Even more needlessly hardcore, Walt wanted the audience to see the villain, man, literally burning to death in the forest fire he causes at the end, to symbolically show the final cost of his hubris. This ridiculously heavy metal idea was once more poo-pooed by the nervous animators, but this one I actually kind of wish that they had kept in. Sounds kind of cool. <laughs> Speaking of Feline a few moments ago, I totally adore her, especially as an adult. From her smooth and sleek design, to her slow and quiet movements, to those literal big brown doe eyes, Together with the enchanting voice of Anne Gillis, Feline is the most unsung and almost totally forgotten Disney princess. I know she isn't an official Disney princess in the lineup, but if being life mate to the next and new Great Prince of the Forest doesn't make you a princess, I don't know what would. Will you shut who is up, on, man? Listen, who is on your list, Joe? Man is not so much a traditional Disney villain, so much as a presence. I would say that Man, as an antagonist in Bambi, is kind of like the Droon from Raya and the Last Dragon, but done competently. Shout out to the ten people in the audience who know what the hell I'm talking about, because you've actually seen Raya and the Last Dragon. <laughs> I, jo I, I, jo I joke, I joke. You know, it's, it's fine. Ever present at the edges of our mind throughout the film, Man is a gnawing, itching, seething danger laced throughout the anatomy of this story. The scene of the pheasant losing her mind with anxiety before eventually flying up and getting shot down is genuinely horrific and sent me into a total panic watching. The killing of Bambi's mom, by probably Gaston for my money, but anyway... Are you here in all of my decorating? ...puts Man on a level with Scar and Frollo in terms of impactful Disney murder of the protagonist's parent. Though never literally seen, only heralded by the great and enormous thunder of their boomsticks. This is my boomstick! The mad dash escape from man at the end of the film is genuinely one of the most tense and raw sequences in any Disney film that I can remember. Also, the scene beforehand where the Prince of the Forest tells Bambi that man is coming is one of the most chilling and foreboding scenes in Disney history, up there with the sacked village in Mulan. The scene of Bambi learning to walk is incredibly sweet and charming, hypnotic in the way it shows us the forest and its creatures through the new eyes of Bambi the young prince. Disney is inviting us into an almost mythical forest here. There's a reason that every deer in every Disney movie ever is always discussed as an easter egg because they all just look exactly like Bambi's mom. Whether Gaston killed his mom or not, Bambi was probably the most iconic and influential of Disney's films starring an animal up until The Lion King. The introduction of the great Prince of the Forest is beyond badass. I really love his theme in the score, the way he stops to look at Bambi, and the way Bambi responds. Absolutely magical, such a perfect moment of stillness and tranquility. Boy, I tell you, a lot of Disney movies open with the birth or christening of the main or title character, usually royalty. I think I, I said that earlier. Anyway, there's also a whole subcategory of Disney movies that turn this trope on its head, with fondling children finding their new family or situation at the beginning of the film, such as in The Jungle Book, Tarzan, or even Meet the Robinsons. Because remember, say it with me, kids, in Disney, two parents is too many. I really love the springtime scene after the time jump. Old friend Owl's beef with the springtime birds, and then his speech afterward on the subject of being twitterpated, their word for smitten or in love, is one of the funniest and most charming scenes I can think of in any Disney film. The Owl's gentle, if slightly busybody form of wisdom and kindness is wonderful. Very similar to Archimedes, a character we will eventually discuss in The Sword and the Stone. 
I also should note, it's not in the script, but Sterling Holloway appears once again for the second time for Disney Animation as the voice of the grown-up skunk, Flower. The subsequent scene of everyone actually becoming Twitter-pated is just about as adorable as a Disney scene can possibly be, especially when it happens to Thumper. His gormless, bug-eyed stare at the lovely, blushing female bunny, very obviously flirting with him, will always make me laugh. Flower and his lady skunk are also the definition of cute. Finally, we get to Bambi himself and his feminine counterpart, the beautiful deer Feline, that his mother set him up with way back when he was a child. No sooner does Bambi reunite with Feline, though, when another stag, unnamed in the film but retroactively called Rano, appears. He is darker in color than Bambi, with larger antlers, and he immediately and aggressively challenges Bambi for Feline's affections, pushing him away with his antlers and attempting to goad Bambi into a fight. Bambi eventually obliges, and the two engage in what is, in my opinion, one of the most thrilling and visually impressive fights ever put into a Disney film. I love the contrast of colors, the enormous shadows and silhouettes, and how it's almost impossible to tell, in most shots, which stag is Rono and which is Bambi. We are put directly into Feline's hooves, watching these two absolutely throw the heck down until Bambi is able to violently yeet Rono into the river below. Holy crud! After the fight, we are treated to Bambi and Feline's falling in love montage. While it's no can you feel the love tonight, this is a sweet sequence, and I have to say that, overall, I kind of prefer Bambi and Feline to Simba and Nala as a couple. Nothing against those two, but there is just something so serene, calm, and effortlessly tranquil between Bambi and Feline. It's instant, and it's pure, and it is true love. Next, Bambi is warned by his father that man is coming, as I mentioned earlier, in a stunningly chilling moment. I will never forget the way that the prince calmly, as if he were Dumbledore himself, right, you put your name in the cupboard of fire. says slowly to Bambi, It is man. He is here again. There are many this time. Oh man! The sadness and resignation in his voice, coupled with the tiniest hint of fear, leaves us with a cool and icy foreboding. Fred Shield's kind yet impenetrable voice performance as the great prince of the forest is subtle yet magnificent, his piercing baritone bringing a weary majesty to this forgotten Disney dad. I didn't get to him much in the characters section, but I really love the great prince of the forest, especially how he protects the other deer at every turn, and steps up to raise Bambi when his mother is eventually killed. The escape from man, his dogs, and his guns is nothing if not one of the tensest damn scenes I've ever seen. I was truly worried for all these characters. Once Bambi's mom dies, no one is safe, and they build the tension up perfectly over and over throughout the narrative. Every time we are too comfortable in our beautiful natural setting, the hidden threat of man begins to creep back into our minds. Nevertheless, Bambi is able to escape man, even after being shot, reuniting with Feline and his father at the end of the river. The shot of Bambi and Feline reuniting and sharing a kiss is simply perfect in every way. The film closes with Friend Owl once more being awoken to see the birth of a pair of new baby deer, Bambi's children, and the next great princes of the forest. The final shot sees Bambi and his father on a hill, overlooking their forest domain. They look to each other, and the great old prince finally turns his back and retreats into the forest, leaving his son now as the forest's proud, strong, solitary new guardian and protector on high, finally closing the loop that began at the beginning of the film. And again, the hilltop is rather similar visually to the symbolism of Pride Rock. And now it's time for the Critics Roundup, which is a section at the end of the videos where I just like to read uh, the thoughts of, uh, and rankings of about 25, 25 in this video of, you know, a couple dozen 
critics from YouTube and from uh, online uh, articles, written articles. And basically we just get a sense of, we see where they've ranked them and their rank of the 60 and then I read you their very quick thoughts on them. Basically it's Rotten Tomatoes except better and not fraudulent and fake and doctored like Rotten Tomatoes is. Video on that coming eventually. LS Mark, 32nd, was surprised by how much he liked it, liked Bambi as a lead and the visuals, loved all the animation and enjoyed the story. Schaeferless Productions, 40th calls it boring and the characters uninteresting with jarring tonal shifts. Praises the animation but says the story is weak and it is too cutesy overall. Sean Chandler, 42nd, says it's cute and iconic but lightweight and not that great. Light on real story, two cycle of life. Brian Hull, 10th, praises animation and music, complains of slight story problems, A tier. The Trove, 20th, says it's beautiful and serene, he loves the animation and the feeling of it, and man as a villain. Dave Lee Down Under, ninth, calls the animation stunning and the characters lovable and timeless, and ninth was I think the lowest that Dave Lee put any of the Golden Era films. <laughs> Modern Mouse, 22nd, calls the story mature and ahead of its time, loves how man is the villain, loves the backgrounds. The 90s Kid, 41st to 48th. Justin watches movies, 18th, calls it a great movie, straightforward, sad, but always interesting. Loves the animation. <clears throat> the Glad and Gladiator, 46th, doesn't have strong feelings on it, says it's good, not one of the best. Chris Itua, 30th, says he loves the animation, says the death of Bambi's mother and man as the villain both stand out a lot. Maple Street Movies, 17th. The Movie Geek, 47th. Calls it outdated and a struggle to get through. That was the YouTube rankings, and now we go over to the online article rankings. Politer. Fourth. Calls it a masterpiece of animation. Unshaved Mouse. <laughs> 16th. Says it has some of the most impressive and immersive animation ever. Cinema Blend. Fifth. Calls it beautiful and heartbreaking, like watching real animals. Paste Magazine, third, calls it heartfelt and sublime. Slash Film, fifth, praises all aspects and calls it eerily straightforward about the ways of nature. Hollywood.com, 31st, says that it rings powerful right at the visceral level. Screen Rant, ninth, says that it is hard to find anyone not emotionally ruined by Bambi. My SF Reviews, 7th. The Playlist, 4th, calls it quiet, beautiful, and pastoral. Says it is close to becoming something like Disney as arthouse film. Noah Fryman, 2nd, says it is nothing short of a masterpiece, calls it one of Disney's most beautiful films. Darth Docking on Reddit, 49th. What Culture, 34th, says it has some charm, but that other than Bambi's mom dying, nothing really happens. So that was 25 reviews, and it had 10 of those 25 ranking it in the top 10. It did not get a single first place, which is the second time that that's happened, because last week's movie Dumbo did not get a single uh, first place ranking, so this is two movies in a row where it has not been anybody's favorite film specifically. Uh, and its highest ranking was second, same, same as Dumbo. It had an average ranking out of the 60 of 21.8, so basically 22nd, and that puts it fifth, or I'm sorry, and that puts it third so far for our Disney movies um, in their average ranking in the critics' rankings, and I haven't added mine to that because that's a secret. Uh, so number one is Snow White at just under 10th average. Number two is Pinocchio so far, just over 16th average. Number three is Bambi with just under 22nd. Number four is Fantasia with just over 22nd. And number five is Dumbo with just over 25th. So Bambi was ranked basically exactly the same on average as Fantasia, but just a little under an average of 22nd and Fantasia was a little bit over. I keep mentioning The Lion King, and there's a good reason for that. 
The Lion King lifts heavily from Bambi, much like Tangled does from Sleeping Beauty, with many of the key elements being near or completely identical. Both Bambi and The Lion King are films written about and from the perspective of animals with human intelligence and society, but who still live in the natural world like their real-life counterparts do. Now, I've already discussed how this is part of Disney's animals with human intelligence and their own societies, but still living in a world that features intelligent humans. But these two, especially, sort of happen without any humans on screen, even though humans are a big element of Bambi and not in The Lion King at all, but still, they happen without any humans actually on screen either. Both open with the birth and presentation of the new prince of this natural landscape and society. Everybody shows up to look at the baby, who is christened in some way in the opening scene. The protagonist slash title character Prince has a very close relationship with one of their parents, Bambi with his mother and Simba with his father. Both of their fathers are presented as regal, respected, and almost mythical figures to all the other animals serving under their leadership. Both Bambi and Simba are in awe of their own father. The parent that the lead was close with dies, and this death is the key moment in the film, happening right before a time jump and representing the beginning of the lead's journey into manhood. Both leads have two specific, notable other animal friends, Bambi having Flower and Thumper, and Simba having Timon and Pumbaa. The parent that the lead was close with dies, and this death is the key moment in the film, happening right before a time jump and representing the beginning of the lead's journey into manhood. Both films have said time jump, picking back up when the lead has grown. Both films feature a pompous and irritable older bird that advises the hero, Friend Owl in Bambi and then Zazu in The Lion King. Both films revolve around nature and the concepts of renewal and death, and the general idea of the circle of life, first hinted towards in Bambi, then eventually fully specifically articulated in The Lion King, in Mufasa's famous speech. Yes. Maybe the best example of this concept of the life cycle in Bambi is what happens right after his mother is killed. After the horrifically sad scene of Bambi initially escaping the hunter himself, turning around to realize that his mother is gone, then being told she's dead and being taken away by his mysterious father into the wintry night, we cut to a bunch of dumb butt birds singing about how in love they are in springtime. It's as brutal a transition as it is hilarious, and the totally out of nowhere sudden cut from wintry grief and death to the joyous rebirth of nature and love in the spring is both intentional and tonally pitch perfect. Yeah, Walt was kind of a maniac, honestly. On the subject of the similarities to The Lion King, Disney likes to do this sometimes, every few decades. They like to take a basic story premise and setup, arc and character tropes, and change around the names and sometimes settings, and then do essentially a soft remake of an old classic. I will touch on in my Sleeping Beauty review how Tangled is essentially Sleeping Beauty but if the princess were the main character instead of the three good fairies. And The Lion King is the exact same as it relates to Bambi here. The time difference is even almost the exact same for both pairs, with The Lion King coming out 52 years after Bambi in 1994, and Tangled coming out 51 years after Sleeping Beauty in 2010. For that matter, Fantasia 2000 is essentially an update of the Fantasia concept for the audience of 2000, and so I would put it into this mini category of films as well, with its 59 year gap between films. Even Tarzan owes a great many similarities to The Jungle Book, especially in character designs and broad story beats, although there was only a 32 year gap between those films, and they are the least similar of these four pairs. This is a truly fascinating revelation, because this shows that Disney as a company has always been perfectly capable of producing a more than competent if not downright genius remake or update for a new generation of their older animated classics. In fact, just last week I went into the trend of Disney Animation doing soft remakes of their own films within the exact same animation era. The horrific glut of Disney live action remakes that we have received over the last 15 years is far more baffling when you know that several times over, Disney has already remade several of their films, almost every time to absolutely gangbusters results. 
If Disney could keep that same energy and artistry it had in these soft remakes for the new live action ones, I'm sure that there would be more than just a small handful of them that would have turned out actually worthwhile. I love the Little Mermaid one though, so you know, fight me. The way that Disney was able to transform Bambi into Simba, Aurora into Rapunzel, and Mowgli into Tarzan decades later, equaling or in some cases even surpassing their older counterparts, is a feat that should be recognized, celebrated, and also viewed as the standard for a Disney remake of any kind. I would also be remiss if I did not mention the themes of naturalism, environmentalism, and conservationism in this film. This story and its themes are deeply concerned with the plight of animals, the ethics of hunting, and the clearly negative impact mankind has had on the environment around us and its billions of non-human occupants. This film took a firm, commendable, and incredibly progressive for its time stance on these issues, arguing passionately for a more humane treatment of animals, and attempting to show us that, just like us, animals are all born, grow up, learn to communicate, laugh, cry, love, hate, experience pain and tragedy, loss and depression, joy and euphoria, live and finally die, exactly as humans do, in communities with forms of language and forming real, lasting emotional bonds within their own families and beyond. This film shows us the humanity in the animals around us, and in doing so, it shows us the humanity in ourselves. In conclusion, in many, many ways, Bambi is an intrinsic and essential part of the very fabric and identity of Disney itself. Up there with a few select others as one of the most important and influential pieces of storytelling and visual art in the canon. While not the first film Disney did in their Animals of Human Intelligence and their own society within our world subgenre, as I alluded to earlier, as that had started the previous year with Dumbo, this is still perhaps their most iconic within that subgenre. To my mind, it is probably a toss-up between this film, 101 Dalmatians, and The Lion King. All in all, Bambi has been one of the biggest surprises of the writing process so far, 19-ish scripts in. Yeah, I was about a third of the way through the writing process when I got to this one. And I really thoroughly enjoyed the experience of it, and gained a greater appreciation of the golden age of Disney. This is honestly just a case of powerful, magical, and timeless Disney storytelling. 9 out of 10. And that's it. Next week, we'll be back again and looking at 1943's Saludos Amigos, the first of the package films, so please do join me for that as well. As well as the regularly scheduled video, I'll also be uploading an extra special deer, but I won't spoil what that will be just yet, just a little short one. Thank you for watching, and if you're still here, good night, good luck, and enjoy the afterword. Not him.